Hello, I'm the doctor. Welcome to Dr. Geek. Today, I'm doing a speed rundown of the 10th Doctor to finish what was my 12 Doctors of Christmas special, but was tragically cut short. Be sure to watch the videos I've already done of Doctors 1 through 9, and check back later for my rundown of 11 and 12 over the next few days, as we finish out this series. Just a reminder, there will be spoilers in this video. I will try to summarize quickly, but key plot points will be revealed. With that said, let's pick up where we last left off. After regenerating, the Doctor is having a harder time with this one than usual, and he crash lands the TARDIS in modern day London, collapsing in front of Mickey and Jackie. Rose tells him that despite his appearance, this is the Doctor, and they put him to bed while he recovers. Rose and Mickey go shopping and are attacked by masked Santa robots, and later, a spinning Christmas tree, before the Doctor wakes up and stops it with a sonic screwdriver. An alien, broadcasting down to Prime Minister Harriet Jones, identifies itself as a Sycorax and causes a third of the world's population to go into a hypnotic state. They demand that the Earth surrender, or the hypnotized people will all commit suicide. Harriet Jones attempts to negotiate and is teleported onto the Sycorax ship, and later, after they detect the TARDIS, it too is teleported to the ship, along with Mickey, Rose, and a still unconscious Doctor. After Rose stalls for time, the Doctor soon emerges fully recuperated, and introduces himself. He shuts down the mind control and challenges the Sycorax to a sword fight over the Earth, losing his right hand in the process. However, since he is close to regeneration, he regrows the hand and defeats the Sycorax. The Doctor orders them to leave the Earth and never come back, before returning to Earth with Harriet, Rose, and Mickey. But as the Sycorax ship begins to leave, Harriet orders her organization Torchwood to fire on them, destroying the ship. The Doctor becomes furious with Harriet, who tries to justify her actions by telling the Doctor he's not always there to save them. Afterwards, the Doctor and Rose set off again in the TARDIS for new adventures. The Doctor takes Rose to the farthest point he's ever taken her, the year 5023, to a planet called New Earth, where humanity settled after the destruction of the original Earth. Through his psychic paper, the Doctor is summoned to Ward 26, to a hospital in New New York, and he meets several feline nuns called the Sisters of Plenitude, who are overseeing their patients here being cured, despite having what appear to be uncurable sicknesses. The Doctor recognizes the face of Bo from last season's The End of the World, and learns that he is the one that summoned the Doctor here. Meanwhile, Rose runs into Cassandra again, also from the episode The End of the World, who is not in fact dead, but is once again a stretched out piece of skin. She tricks Rose into stepping into a psychograft, and Cassandra possesses her body. She meets up with the Doctor, and together they learn that the hospital houses thousands of pods containing artificially grown humans, which the sisters purposely give terrible diseases so they can discover cures. The Doctor becomes suspicious of Cassandra, and she makes her escape by releasing some of the patients from their pods as a distraction. A quarantine is ordered, as with just a touch, the patients begin to infect the sisters with their horrifying diseases. The Doctor and Cassandra make their way to Ward 26 and empty all the medical solutions into a disinfectant shower, curing all the patients. The police arrest the surviving sisters, and the Doctor orders Cassandra out of Rose's body. The face of Bo tells the Doctor that he has a message for him, but it can wait until they meet for a third and final time. Attempting to reach Sheffield in 1979, the TARDIS instead arrives in the Scottish Moors in 1879 and the Doctor and Rose encounter a carriage containing Queen Victoria, who is traveling to Aberdeen. The Doctor adopts a Scottish accent and claims to be Dr. James McCrimmon, and he convinces the Queen to invite him and Rose to join her as she travels to the Torchwood Estate to spend the night. Unknown to them, however, the estate has been taken over by monks, and they have brought a man infected with a form of lycanthropy, essentially werewolf syndrome, hoping to pass it to the Queen and create an empire of the wolf. The Doctor discovers their plan, and he takes Rose and the Queen to the estate's study, where the walls are coated with mistletoe oil, which for some reason repels the werewolf. Using the library, they discover the wolf is actually an alien species that fell to Earth in 1540, surviving by passing its form from human to human. The Doctor also realizes the estate was designed to trap the wolf, and he uses a strange telescope along with the Queen's diamond to force the werewolf to revert to human form. The human begs the Doctor to kill him by increasing the power, and the Doctor obliges. The Queen has a small cut that she insists is a splinter, but the Doctor wonders if the royal family may have inherited the condition. The next day, the Queen knights the Doctor and Rose, before banishing them from the British Empire, horrified by their connection to the strange world of terrors she has just witnessed. After they leave, 
the Queen orders the creation of the Torchwood Institute to help defend Britain from further alien attacks. The Doctor, under the alias of John Smith, goes undercover with Rose at a high school to get to the bottom of why a headmaster, Mr. Finch, is feeding his students chips to make them smarter. Rose, working in the kitchens, reports that the oil the chips are cooked in must be handled in hazmat suits. Mr. Finch's success has also caught the eye of an investigative reporter, the fourth Doctor's old companion, Miss Sarah Jane Smith. When Sarah Jane discovers the TARDIS, the Doctor reveals himself to her, and she yells at him for never returning. Sarah Jane meets Rose and Mickey, and the two women immediately form a jealousy of each other. As the group search the school, they discover a room full of giant sleeping bat creatures, and they return to Sarah Jane's car, where she reveals an inactive K-9. The Doctor repairs K-9, and they use him to identify the oil being used in the kitchens as Krillotine oil, meaning the creatures are Krillotines, a composite species who take the best physical parts of the species they encounter. They discover that they are using the computers, along with the students' enhanced intelligence, in an effort to solve the theory of everything, which would allow the Krillotines full control over time and space. Mickey uses Sarah Jane's car to crash through the school's doors, allowing the children to flee. The Doctor leads the Krillotines to the kitchen, and once they are there, K-9 detonates the chip oil, destroying the school along with himself. Later, Sarah Jane declines the Doctor's offer to travel with him again. Mickey tells the Doctor that he would like to join him, however, and the three of them say their goodbye to Sarah Jane. As a parting gift, the Doctor gives her a new canine. The TARDIS materializes on a spaceship and damage in the need of repairs. The Doctor, Rose, and Mickey on his first proper TARDIS adventure begin to explore, and when they come upon an 18th century fireplace, the Doctor, confused, looks through it and sees a young girl named Renette, who lives in Paris in the year 1729. The Doctor realizes that the fireplace is a time window, accessing another time and place. He uses a switch on the fireplace to rotate it around the wall and arrives in Renette's bedroom, but he finds that months have gone by for her since their first meeting only moments ago. Hearing a ticking noise, the Doctor tracks it under Renette's bed and discovers a clockwork creature that quickly attacks him, although he manages to trick it into returning to the spaceship. He discovers that the creature is an android and was scanning Renette's brain, programmed to only answer to her. Before he can analyze it more, the android disappears. The Doctor returns to Renette's bedroom, finding that she is now a young woman, and she flirts with the Doctor before they kiss. The Doctor realizes that she is Madame du Pompadour, the mistress of King Louis XV. He returns to the ship and discovers many more windows to different points of Renette's life, and seeing her being attacked by an android, goes through one to defend her, telling her to give the androids orders which they obey. They tell her that they are repair androids, whose ship was damaged in an ion storm. They did not have the necessary parts to repair the ship, and killed their crew to use their organs for parts. However, they need one more part, Renette's brain. They believe her brain will be compatible with the ship when she is 27 years old. The Doctor returns to the ship, but sadly, the time window he needs for 27 is a mirror, and if they smash through it to save her, the window will lose its connection to the ship. Undeterred, the Doctor uses a horse he found to smash through the window, and the androids shut down, realizing that they can no longer use the time window to return to their ship. Renette tells the Doctor that she had her old fireplace brought to Versailles in hopes that he would one day return, and the Doctor uses it to get back to the ship, telling Renette to pack her bags and prepare to leave. However, when he returns just seconds later, he learns that seven years have passed and Renette has died. The King gives the Doctor a letter that she wrote him, where she confesses her love for him and hopes that he will make a quick return. The Doctor returns to the TARDIS and watches the time windows close before leaving the ship. As the TARDIS crew wonder why the androids were so fixated on Renette, they dematerialize, and it is revealed that the ship's name was the SS Madame de Pompadour. While Rose and the Doctor chat about their past adventures, the TARDIS jolts, and the Doctor says they have fallen out of the time vortex. With the power cells dead, they are lost in the void, but Mickey opens the doors and they realize they are actually back in London, only in a parallel reality. Finding a small bit of power, the Doctor leaves the TARDIS to recharge, and they decide to explore, discovering that most of the population here wear ear pods from Cybus Industries that feed information directly to their brains. Rose sees a billboard with her father's face on it, but the Doctor warns her not to go looking for him as he's not her real dad, and Mickey decides to look for his grandmother, who died in his universe a few years back. Meanwhile, in Cybus Industries, founder John Lumick tries to gain approval for his plan to upgrade humanity by putting their brains into metal exoskeletons, but he is turned down. However, 
he has already been secretly conducting experiments using the homeless and turning them into cyborgs. A group called the Preachers have been investigating this activity, helped in part by Pete Tyler feeding them information. And one of the Preachers finds Mickey, confusing him for his in-universe counterpart, Ricky, and takes him to their hideout where he meets the real Ricky and decides to join the Preachers on their planned raid that night of Pete Tyler's house, which John Lumick will be attending. Rose and the Doctor visit the party as well, but it is interrupted by the new Cybermen, and Lumick says he is moving forward with his plans regardless of approval and all of humanity will be upgraded, with anyone who refuses being deleted. The Doctor, Rose, and Pete escape and meet up with the Preachers outside, but they are soon surrounded. The Doctor tells everyone to surrender and volunteer for the upgrade, but the Cybermen say they are incompatible and will be deleted. The Doctor uses the recharging power cell from the TARDIS to destroy the Cybermen, and they escape. Meanwhile, John Lumick orders the Cybermen to activate the earpods to control the people of London and bring them in for conversions. The group see Lumic Zeppelin by the power station and attempt to destroy the earpod transmitter inside of it, but during approach, Ricky is killed. The Doctor discovers the Cybermen have an emotional inhibitor preventing them from feeling emotion, and he plans to disable that to defeat them. But he is soon captured and taken to Lumic, who has been converted into a cyber controller. While the Doctor speaks to Lumic, Mickey and the Saviors get into the Zeppelin and destroy the transmitter, causing the now conscious humans to flee in terror. When the Doctor can't convince Lumic to stop his plan, he uses Rose's phone to block the inhibitors and sends the Cybermen into despair. As the facility begins to go up in flames, they make their escape, and Pete kills Lumic. Returning to the TARDIS, the Doctor revives it with the power cell. Rose tells Pete that she is his daughter, but he leaves, overwhelmed. Finally, Mickey decides he's better off in this universe where he can help the Preachers and take care of his grandmother, and he says his goodbyes to Rose. The Doctor tries to take Rose to see Elvis, but they accidentally end up in London in the year 1953. They notice that most of the houses here have TV antennas, which should be rare for this time. Speaking to the TV salesman, Mr. Magpie, they learn that the TVs are on sale for the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. They see the police take a person out of their home with a sheet over their head and drive away. And later, they meet a local family called the Connollys and are introduced to the grandmother, whose entire face is missing. Suddenly, the police burst in and remove her as well. As the doctor follows the police, Rose returns to Magpie's shop and discovers an alien calling itself the Wire that's managed to escape execution by its people and turned itself into an electrical form. Its plan is to consume enough minds to recreate its body, and it will use the broadcast of the Queen's coronation to do so. Before she can flee, Rose has her face stolen as well. Meanwhile, as the doctor questions police, a faceless Rose is brought in. Angry, the doctor confronts Magpie and the Wire at his shop but the wire retreats after seeing the sonic screwdriver and heads for the television transmitter. The doctor creates a device to capture the wire and uses it on the transmitter, succeeding in stopping its plan. The faceless people are returned to normal, and Rose and the doctor celebrate the coronation with everyone else. The TARDIS next arrives aboard a sanctuary base used for deep space expeditions. The doctor and Rose explore the base and discover strange alien writing that the TARDIS can't translate, meaning it's impossibly old. They are confronted by an Ood, a docile slave race who work on the station with the humans. The Doctor and Rose meet the crew of the base, Zack, Ida, Jefferson, Danny, Scooty, and Toby, and learn that they are on an expedition to the mysterious planet Crop Tor, which is impossibly in orbit around a black hole. The crew used a gravity tunnel to arrive here, which was being generated by an immense power 10 miles below the surface, which the crew are now digging towards in an attempt to discover what it is. Suddenly. A quake causes the section of the station housing the TARDIS to fall to the planet, leaving them stranded. As the drill nears its target, the Ood's translation spheres reveal messages about the beast awakening, and Toby is possessed by the beast. While the possessed Toby kills Scooty, the Doctor offers to go with Ida into the bowels of the planet down the drill shaft. They find a large disc with more markings that the Doctor believes to be a door, and they watch as it opens. Suddenly, the Beast transfers into all the Ood, and they refer to themselves as the Legion of the Beast, while Rose and the remaining crew are alerted that the planet is now falling towards the black hole. The Ood begin to close in on them, while the voice of the Beast declares that it is free. Rose and the crew run from the possessed Ood, and while Toby is still possessed as well, Rose convinces the group that he is not, since they saw the Beast leave his body and enter the Ood. The Beast uses the Ood to explain that he is the epitome of all evil across religions, and he was sealed in the pit before the universe began and is seeking to escape. Suddenly, the cable snaps, trapping Ida and the Doctor ten miles underground. 
Rose and the crew decide to turn off the telepathy that keeps the Ood functioning, and are forced to head through the air shafts while Captain Zack directs the air supply to follow them. Rose, Danny, and Toby manage to escape the shafts alive and incapacitate the Ood before reuniting with the captain, who then knocks out Rose, who wanted to wait for the doctor, so they can board the escape rocket. Meanwhile, the doctor detaches himself from the lift cable, falling to the bottom of the pit unharmed thanks to an air cushion. Cave paintings depict the beast's final battle and imprisonment, and the doctor discovers two jars on pedestals in front of the massive form of the beast. The doctor deduces that Crop Tor was designed as the perfect prison for the beast. Its jailers devised the jars as a failsafe, since their destruction would cause the planet to plunge into the black hole with the body of the beast destroyed. Although the doctor realizes he must also sacrifice Rose and the others to destroy the beast, he does it anyway, having faith in Rose. As the planet falls out of orbit, the doctor stumbles across his TARDIS. On the escape rocket, Toby reveals the beast is still possessing him, and Rose takes the captain's gun and shoots out the rocket's front window, unhooking Toby's safety harness and sending him tumbling towards the black hole. Suddenly, the rocket turns away from the black hole, and the doctor contacts Captain Zack, telling him he's towing the rocket to safety with the TARDIS. He tells them that he's managed to save Ida, but he had no time to save the Ood, who were innocent victims of the beast's possession. Once safe, the two crews depart on their separate ways. We are next presented with the video diary of a young man named Alton Pope as he explains his interactions with the 10th Doctor. Basically, he forms a fan club for the Doctor called Linda, or London Investigation and Detective Agency. And then an alien called an Absorbaloff comes along and absorbs them all before being stopped by the Doctor. It's a weird, weird story. Moving on, the TARDIS materializes in London, again, on the day of the opening ceremony for the 2012 Olympics. While the neighborhood they arrive in is excited for the passing of the Olympic torch, several children have gone missing in the last week. The Doctor and Rose investigate and discover the source of the problem is a 12-year-old girl named Chloe Weber, who has the ability to cause people to disappear by drawing them. The Doctor hypnotizes Chloe and finds that she is possessed by an immature Isolus, an alien life form that travels through space with a family of billions, but Crash landed alone and discovered a similarly lonely little girl. The Doctor tries to find the Isolus' pod to allow it to leave, but Chloe draws the Doctor and the TARDIS, trapping them. Rose finds the pod and uses the Olympic torch to recharge it, causing everyone that disappeared to return. As the Doctor and Rose walk to the Olympics, Rose comments to an uneasy Doctor that nothing will ever split them up. Rose and the Doctor return to present day to visit Jackie, but when they arrive, Jackie tells them that she is expecting her deceased father to join them. Sure enough, a luminous humanoid figure appears and Jackie greets it happily, and they see on television that this is a worldwide phenomenon that has been going on for weeks. The dead are apparently walking, but the doctor, obviously skeptical of ghosts, analyzes one with the TARDIS and determines that they are actually impressions of something forcing its way into the universe. The doctor tracks his signal to the Torchwood Institute, and the director shows the doctor the source of the ghost energy, an invisible breach in the universe through which a mysterious spherical object has appeared. Upon inspection, the doctor determines that the object is a void ship, designed to exist in the space between universes, and completely undetectable by all scientific instruments. Torchwood has been conducting experiments on the breach, forcing it open in an attempt to harness it as a source of energy, but they are clueless as to the origins of the sphere. Meanwhile, Rose slips out of the TARDIS, and using a lab coat and the psychic paper, manages to sneak into the sphere room, but is stopped by a scientist. However, Mickey is there as well, and they make eye contact. The breach is opened once again, and the ghost figures reveal their true forms, the Cybermen. At the same time, the Void Ship begins to activate. As the Cybermen take over Torchwood, the Cybermen tell the Doctor that they did not create the Void Ship, but simply followed its path here. In the Sphere Chamber, Mickey tells Rose that the Cybermen disappeared from the parallel universe, but he found a way to follow them here, and as he prepares to fire on the Void Ship, it opens to reveal four Daleks, along with a device they call the Genesis Arc. The Cybermen detect the Daleks and contact them to offer an alliance, but the Daleks refuse and begin to exterminate the Cybermen, who are no match for the Daleks' weaponry. Jake, one of the preachers, arrives from the parallel universe and kills the Cyber Controller before taking the Doctor back with him to Pete's dimension, where he meets the alternate Pete Tyler and learns that if they don't seal the breach, both universes will be destroyed. Meanwhile, the four Daleks, Dalek Sek, Dalek Jast, Dalek Fay, and Dalek Khan, tell Rose and Mickey that the Genesis Arc is stolen Time Lord technology. The Doctor arrives and realizes that the four Daleks are the infamous Cult of Scarrow, and he uses the Sonic to let the Cybermen into the Sphere Chamber. 
The two enemies attack each other, but in the confusion, Mickey touches the Genesis Arc, opening it and releasing hundreds of Daleks. The Doctor plans to reverse the breach, sending anything that's crossed through universes into the void. He sends everyone, including Rose and Jackie, back to Pete's world, where they will be safe. But wanting to be with the Doctor, even if it means not seeing her family ever again, Rose jumps back just in time and starts to help the Doctor prepare. The Doctor and Rose open the breach and hang on to magnetic clamps as the Cybermen and Daleks are pulled in, though the Cult of Scarrow managed to escape. However, at the last minute, Rose loses her grip and plunges towards the breach, but Pete Tyler appears at the last second to grab her and take her back with him. The breach closes and both Rose and the Doctor are devastated at losing each other. Days later, Rose has a dream that leads her to a beach in Norway that translates to Bad Wolf Bay. The Doctor appears as a hologram and he tells Rose that he's using the energy of a supernova to transmit to her one last time. Rose tearfully tells the Doctor that she loves him, but before the Doctor can reply, the breach closes for good. Tears run down the Doctor's cheeks as he regains his composure and begins to pilot the TARDIS alone. However, he suddenly notices a woman in a wedding dress standing next to the console, and she angrily demands to know where she is. The Doctor learns the woman's name is Donna Noble, and he performs tests on her before landing on Earth across town from her wedding. She calls a cab, but is picked up by a robotic Santa, and the Doctor uses the TARDIS to save her. He gives her a ring that will shield her from the Santas and escorts her to her wedding, where her friends and family are having the reception without her. Despite the ring, the Santas attack again, and the Doctor tracks their signal to a ship in orbit around Earth. Learning that Donna works at Torchwood, they go there and find a tunnel leading to the center of Earth, and inside discover the Empress of the Rachnos, a spider species wiped out eons ago by the Time Lords. It turns out Donna's fiancé was working for the Empress, priming Donna to help free the Empress's children. However, when the Doctor and Donna escape, the Empress uses the fiancé instead. They use the TARDIS to travel billions of years to the past, and discover that an inert Rachnos ship became the core of the Earth as the planet formed around it. Returning to the present, they try to stop the Rachnos, but are too late. The Doctor detonates an explosive he set earlier, flooding the tunnel with water and washing the Rachnos back into the pit. They escape, as does the Empress, but her ship is destroyed by human forces acting on behalf of a mysterious Mr. Saxon. The Doctor brings Donna home and offers to bring her with him, but she declines. The Doctor goes undercover as a patient named John Smith at a hospital in London and meets a medical student named Martha Jones. Strangely, the entire hospital is transported to the moon by a police for hire race of aliens called the Jadoon, who look like humanoid rhinos. They are looking for a plasmavore, a blood consuming alien with a shape shifting ability and they begin scanning everyone in the hospital. The doctor teams up with Martha, telling her if he is scanned, he too will register as non-human, and that will not be good. As people in the hospital begin fainting from lack of oxygen, the plasmavore evades capture by sucking the blood of a human and impersonating it. However, the doctor tricks it into sucking his own blood, and when the Jadoon scan the plasmavore again, it registers as an alien and is captured and executed. Martha revives the doctor, and the hospital is returned to Earth just in time. The Doctor then invites Martha along for one trip on the TARDIS, and she hesitantly accepts. The two arrive in Elizabethan London in 1599, and the Doctor takes Martha to a performance at the Globe Theatre. At the end, Shakespeare appears, and a witch uses voodoo to make him promise a new play the very next day. The mysterious unpublished Shakespeare play. The Doctor and Martha meet Shakespeare, and that night, a witch uses a marionette to compel him to write a strange ending to the new play. The witch is discovered by Shakespeare's lover, Dolly, who dies of fright, and Martha, after hearing her screams, sees the witch fly away. They travel to the Globe Theatre, and the doctor asks why it has 14 sides. They find the architect in a catatonic state, and he tells them that the witches dictated the plans to him. The doctor determines that the witches are Carrionites, a species whose magic is based on the power of words, which allows them to manipulate psychic energy. They intend to use the play and the strange final words to free their species from eternal imprisonment. Unable to stop the play, a portal opens, allowing Carrionites to enter the universe. The doctor tells Shakespeare he has the power to close it, and he improvises a short rhyming stanza to close the portal. The doctor takes a crystal ball containing the three witches with him into the TARDIS. As Martha and Doctor say goodbye to Shakespeare and leave, Queen Elizabeth arrives and bizarrely declares the doctor her sworn enemy. They next travel to the year 5,053 on New Earth, the same planet he took Rose to. While the Doctor is looking around, Martha is kidnapped by a couple named Milo and Sheen, 
so that they will have enough people in their car to use the fast lane, promising to drop Martha off when they reach their destination 10 miles away in six years. The doctor chases after them, jumping from car to car along the motorway, where thousands of hover vans are stuck in endless gridlock. As Martha's car descends into the fast lane, they are warned to leave before the creatures that live in the fast lane eat them, but Milo refuses. The doctor, who is just above them, sees the floor of the motorway is filled with macra, giant crab creatures last seen by the second doctor in the serial The Macra Terror. Martha tells Milo to cut the power so the macra can't see them. But before the doctor can reach them, he is teleported to the face of Bo by one of the cat nurses. They explain how the surface population of the planet was wiped out by a new drug, and the people on the motorway were quarantined, but have been trapped inside for years. The doctor works to power up the systems, and the face of Bo sacrifices his life energy to open the motorway, allowing the cars to escape. The face of Bo, just before dying, tells the doctor his final message. You are not alone. The Doctor and Martha arrive in New York City in November 1930 during the Great Depression, landing the TARDIS at the base of the Statue of Liberty. Hearing about missing people, they travel to a tent city in Central Park known as Hooverville, and while there, they are recruited to do some work in the sewers. Once down there, they are attacked by pig creatures and forced to retreat. They later come across a Dalek, confirming the Doctor's suspicions that they are the ones behind the disappearances, rounding up humans to convert them into pig slaves or worse. Traveling to the Empire State Building, they run into the Cult of Skaro, who are attempting to merge the Dalek and human races. Dalek Sek conducts the first experiment on himself, becoming the first Dalek-human hybrid. The Doctor uses his Sonic and they all escape, returning to Hooverville, before being recaptured and brought back. The Doctor agrees to help Dalek Sek create a new race of hybrids on a new planet, but the other members of the Cult of Skaro stage a mutiny, declaring Sek a traitor and ultimately killing him. They instead decide to create a new race of Daleks, but when the Doctor interferes with their energy collection, he infuses some of himself into the hybrids, allowing them to be controlled by him. The hybrid army turn on the cult, killing Thay and Jast, but Dalek Khan manages to terminate the army and escape via another temporal shift. The Doctor returns Martha to her flat in London shortly after she left, and they see her sister on TV with her boss, Professor Lazarus, who claims he will change what it means to be human intriguing the doctor. At the launch party, an elderly Lazarus steps into a machine, and despite an overload that the doctor must step in to stop, he walks out moments later a young man, having manipulated his DNA to make himself younger, but the doctor is suspicious of the side effects, and after analyzing a sample of his DNA, he confirms that Lazarus is mutating. Lazarus goes to the roof with Martha's sister, and when Martha and the doctor confront them, Lazarus transforms into a terrible monster and attacks them. They run away, but become trapped in Lazarus' machine, and when he activates it, the Doctor uses his sonic to reverse the polarity, sending the energy out at Lazarus, and transforming him back into a human. However, he soon kills two ambulance workers, and the Doctor and Martha chase him to a cathedral. Martha and her sister lead him to the top of the bell tower, and the Doctor uses the organ to cause him to fall back to the ground, this time killing him for good. Afterwards, the Doctor invites Martha along again with him, but she refuses unless he makes her an official traveler, and he agrees. The Doctor and Martha receive a distress signal from a spacecraft that's hurtling towards a star. After landing, they become separated from the TARDIS by rising temperatures on the ship, whose engines have failed, leaving them only 42 minutes before they plunge into the star. While Martha works to get to the bridge controls by getting through 30 deadlock doors, the Doctor works with the engineering team to repair the engines. One of the crew, Corwin, becomes infected by something that causes his body temperature to rise incredibly high. He escapes and dons a welding helmet, killing crew members and infecting others. One of the infected, Ashton, confronts Martha, and she takes refuge in an escape pod, which Ashton then jettisons towards the star. The doctor learns this and puts on a spacesuit to go outside and activate the magnetic control to recover the pod. As the doctor looks at the star, he too becomes infected and learns that the star is a living being that the crew illegally mined of its heart for fuel. The doctor orders the crew to dump the fuel and the engines restart, allowing them to pull away from the star. The doctor and Martha say their goodbyes and the doctor gives her a key to the TARDIS. After being pursued by an enemy called the Family of Blood who are after the doctor's life force, the doctor tells Martha he must go into hiding until they die out, using a fob wash called a chameleon arch to change himself into a human 
and hold his Time Lord essence and memories. As a result, the two are on Earth in the year 1913, with the Doctor posing as a teacher named John Smith at a boys' school, and Martha posing as his maid, while also guarding his watch. John Smith begins to fall in love with the school nurse, Joan Redfern, and Martha becomes concerned, as the Doctor, while leaving her many instructions, did not tell her what to do if he fell in love. The Family of Blood track the Doctor to Earth, and when a boy named Timmy finds the watch and opens it, it draws them to the school. When Martha realizes they have been found, she looks for the watch, but being unable to find it, she tries to convince John Smith that he is the Doctor, and he angrily fires her. He instead takes Joan out to a dance that night, but Martha again tries to wake his Time Lord spirit, using the sonic screwdriver to jog his memory. The Family of Blood see this and confront the Doctor, taking Martha and Joan hostage. Timothy opens the watch again, distracting the family and allowing them to escape back to the school where they prepare for an attack. The family uses an army of scarecrows to attack the school, and the boys defend against the first wave with their guns. But the Doctor, Martha, and Joan escape and are found by Timmy, who gives them back the watch. They implore John Smith to use the watch, but he breaks down, not wanting to give up his life as a human with Joan. John Smith takes the watch to the family's ship, offering to trade it to them if they leave the Earth in peace. But when they open the watch, they realize it is empty, and the Doctor is back, having used the distraction to initiate the self-destruct on their ship. They all escape the explosion, but the Doctor captures them, and punishes each of them severely and for all eternity. And they realize that he didn't hide because he was afraid of them, he did it to show them mercy. The Doctor asks Joan to travel with him, but she refuses, angry at him for choosing her time to hide it, and being responsible for the deaths of so many. He leaves John Smith's diary with her, and they leave. After the Doctor and Martha get sent back in time to 1969 by an alien race called the Weeping Angels, the Doctor must send a hidden message in old videos to a woman named Sally Sparrow, explaining the Weeping Angels to her and instructing her on how to send the TARDIS back in time to him. He tells her that the Angels are quantum locked, meaning they can't move while they are being looked at, but the second you blink, they can kill you, as they move unbelievably fast. Sally manages to defeat the Angels and reunite the Doctor and Martha with their TARDIS. The Doctor once again lands his TARDIS on the Cardiff Rift from Series 1's The Unquiet Dead to recharge his power cells, when Jack Harkness begins to run towards them. The Doctor tries to dematerialize, but Jack grabs onto the outside, causing the TARDIS to fly to the end of the universe trying to shake him off. Jack appears dead, but quickly revives, and explains to the Doctor that after he left him on Satellite 5, he used a vortex manipulator to travel back to Earth, but ended up in the 19th century and has had to live through all of that time, revealing that since being revived by the Bad Wolf, he cannot die. They are near the heat death of the universe, and as they explore, they see a man being chased by cannibals. They help him reach a nearby missile silo, where they meet a scientist named Professor Yana and his insectoid assistant, Chantho. The pair are working on a rocket to escape the planet and reach what they call Utopia, the last hope for humanity. The Doctor and Jack help them repair the rocket, despite some sabotage, and the Doctor tells Jack that he left him on Satellite 5 because of his immortality, which disturbs the Doctor. They discuss his new regeneration, and Professor Yana, hearing the word, begins to hear drums in his head. Martha notices a fob watch exactly like the chameleon arch the Doctor used, and unintentionally calls Yana's attention to it. She goes to tell the Doctor about it, but it is too late, as he opens the watch just as the Doctor initiates the rocket's launch sequence. Yana opens the gates, allowing the cannibals to get in, and when Chantho confronts him, he attacks her, telling her that his name is the Master. Chantho manages to shoot the Master before she dies, and he stumbles into the Doctor's TARDIS just as the Doctor arrives, deadlocking the doors. The Master regenerates inside the TARDIS, becoming young like the Doctor, and he dematerializes the TARDIS. The Doctor uses the Sonic to lock the TARDIS's controls to the last place it visited, and the TARDIS disappears, stranding the Doctor, Martha, and Jack at the end of the universe. The group uses Jack's Vortex Manipulator to travel to present-day London, and they learn that the Master has taken the persona of Harold Saxon, the newly elected Prime Minister, using a phone network called Archangel to subliminally influence the population to vote for him. They learn that Martha's family has been arrested, and the Master contacts them to gloat, explaining that he was resurrected by the Time Lords during the Time War, but escaped to the end of the universe to hide when defeat seemed inevitable. They see on TV that the Master will reveal the Earth's first contact the next day with aliens called the Toclophane, from his flying aircraft, the Valiant. The group uses the Vortex Manipulator to get onto the Valiant where the Master is with his new wife, 
and they discover that the TARDIS has been converted into a Paradox Machine, building a power to be activated at an appointed time. The first of the Taklofane arrive, and the Master orders it to kill the US President, which it does. The Master then discovers the Doctor, and uses his sonic screwdriver to age the Doctor 100 years and kill Jack. But he quickly revives and gives Martha his Vortex Manipulator so she can escape. The Paradox Machine activates and a massive rift opens, allowing the Taklofane to descend onto Earth. The Master orders them to kill one-tenth of the Earth's population, and they begin their slaughter. After the Doctor whispers in her ear, Martha teleports to Earth and flees as the Taklofane wreak havoc. One year later, humanity is on the verge of extinction. Martha has been traveling the world on foot, using a perception filter to avoid detection, and contacting several groups to find a special gun created by Torchwood and Unit that can kill the Master. Martha meets a group that has managed to capture a Taklofane, and upon examining it, they discover that the Taklofane are actually the humans from the end of the universe who took the rocket to Utopia. They were driven insane after discovering Utopia was a lie. The Master created the Paradox Machine to allow them to return to the past and kill their ancestors. One of the group members betrays Martha, and the Master's forces corner her, forcing her to surrender. The Master destroys her gun and takes her back to the Valiant so he can kill her in front of the aged Doctor. As the Master gloats, Martha reveals that the gun was just a decoy, and she has actually spent the last year preparing the surviving humans to concentrate their thoughts on the Doctor, who has been integrating himself into the Master's Archangel network. The Doctor uses their energy to rejuvenate himself, and overcomes his captivity, forcing the Master to cower in fear. Martha and her family free Jack and destroy the Paradox Machine. Time snaps back, and the events of the last year are completely erased as the Taklofane disappear. However, everyone on the Valiant can still remember what happened. As they contemplate the Master's fate, his wife Lucy shoots him, and the Master, refusing to regenerate, dies in the Doctor's hands. The Doctor cremates the Master, but a woman is seen picking up his ring from the ashes. Martha decides to leave the Doctor to care for her family and finish school, but she gives the Doctor her phone just in case she ever needs to contact him. The Doctor leaves, and after having a brief encounter with his fifth incarnation when their time streams cross, he forgets to redeploy the shields and crashes into a spaceship called the Titanic, leaving the Doctor very confused. He repairs the damage and materializes upon the ship, which is a luxury Starliner, currently orbiting Earth to observe its Christmas traditions. The Doctor meets a waitress named Astrid Peth and convinces her to accompany him on an excursion to the surface. But when they arrive, the city of London is strangely deserted, and a man named Wolfred Mott tells the Doctor that everyone has gone since the last few years have been so crazy at Christmas time. They return to the ship, and shortly after, the Captain purposely lowers the shield and magnetizes the hull, causing meteors to crash into the Starliner and send it hurtling towards Earth. As the Doctor and a few other survivors attempt to reach the bridge, they are attacked by the ship's androids, who look like golden angels. When the angels capture the Doctor, he confuses them, forcing them to bring him to their controller, Max Capricorn, former owner of the Starliner's company, who planned the crash to retaliate against the company for voting him out. To save the Doctor, Astrid rams Max into the ship's engine with a forklift, killing them both in the process. With Max dead, the androids begin to follow the Doctor's commands, and they help him reach the bridge and restart the ship's engines. After stabilizing the ship, the Doctor attempts to revive Astrid with her teleport bracelet, but the technology is too badly damaged. The Doctor teleports back to Earth, finding the TARDIS, and departs alone. While investigating a company called Adipose Industries, who are marketing a special diet pill, the Doctor runs into Donna Noble once again, who has become interested in conspiracy theories since meeting the Doctor two years ago, and regretting not joining him every day since. They discover that the motto of the company, that the fat just walks away, is quite literal, creating small white aliens that spawn from the host bodies in the night. The two are discovered by a woman named Miss Foster, who tells them that the Adipose lost their breeding planet and she was hired to help them find a new one. The Adipose spawn throughout the city, and the adults appear to collect their young, killing Miss Foster in the process to cover their unsanctioned colonization. Donna accepts the Doctor's original offer to travel with him, and before leaving, tells a blonde woman to give the message to a friend in a few moments. The woman turns out to be Rose Tyler, who fades from view as she walks away. The Doctor and Donna travel to Pompeii in the 1st century AD, on the day that the volcano will erupt, destroying the city. 
Upon realizing this, they return to the TARDIS to find it's been taken by a local sculptor named Lobus Caecilius. They travel to Caecilius' house to retrieve it and meet a local priest named Lucius Petrus, who stops by, possessing powers of ESP that allow him to know the Doctor's home planet is Gallifrey. The Doctor breaks into Lucius' home and discovers plans for an energy converter, but he is discovered by Lucius, who sends a stone creature after them. Caecilius' son kills the creature, but in the confusion, Donna is kidnapped by the Sibylline Sisterhood. The Doctor goes after her and meets the High Priestess of the Sisterhood, who is nearly completely stoned. The Doctor realizes the sisters are being controlled by Pyrovilles, volcanic creatures whose home planet was lost. The Doctor and Donna escape underground towards the heart of Mount Vesuvius, and the Doctor discovers that the volcano is being used by the Pyrovilles to convert the human race and conquer Earth. The Doctor realizes that they must stop the energy converter by causing the volcano to erupt, and is it, as it is a fixed point in time that must happen. The two of them get into an escape pod and overload the converter, triggering the eruption and killing the pyrovales, while also launching their pod out of the volcano. They return to the TARDIS, leaving Caecilius and his family cowering in their home, not wanting to alter history. But Donna begs him to at least save one person. So the Doctor returns for Caecilius' family, who he leaves on a hill to mourn the destruction of Pompeii. The TARDIS next materializes on a snowy planet, and while exploring, they find an injured Ood, who while usually calm, lunges at the Doctor with red eyes just before it dies. They find a nearby complex called Ood Operations that has been harvesting and selling the Ood as servants, and the Doctor discovers they are on the Ood Sphere in the year 4126, similar to the Sense Sphere from the first Doctor's story, The Sensorites. They learn that the Red Eye problem has been happening a lot with the Ood recently, and many people have died. While exploring, they find a group of Ood singing, and are surprised to see that instead of translators in their hands like most Ood, they are holding a second brain that gives them individuality, and it is apparently being removed to make the Ood docile and subservient. The Doctor and Donna are captured, but soon the Ood leader revolts. They follow the CEO of Ood Operations, Halpin, to a large warehouse containing a massive brain, where the Ood's collective consciousness is being limited by a force field. Halpin tries to kill the brain, but his personal Ood servant stops him, revealing he has been slowly poisoning him over the years, changing him into an Ood himself. And the change happens right in front of them, as Halpin becomes an Ood before their very eyes. The Doctor shuts down the force field, freeing the Ood's brain and allowing them to sing once again. As they prepare to leave, Ood Sigma promises to include the Doctor Donna in the song, but also tells the Doctor that his song will be ending soon. Martha uses her phone to call the Doctor, and minutes later, the TARDIS materializes, with the Doctor introducing Martha to Donna. Martha is now working with the unit, and they have been looking into Atmos, a company marketing a satellite navigation system developed by a young genius, Luke Radigan. Unit is concerned because the Atmos technology doesn't seem human, and may be responsible for a string of deaths. The Doctor travels to Radigan's private school to investigate, and discovers his old enemy the Centaurans are behind the plot having not faced them since the Sixth Doctor story, The Two Doctors. Instead of an invasion, they are trying to take control of the Earth with clones, mind control, and the Atmos system, and Martha is captured and cloned. As Donna goes home to warn her family, the Centaurans activate the Atmos devices in all the cars, and they begin to emit a poisonous gas, with Donna's grandfather Wilfred trapped inside. Donna's mother uses an axe to free him, and the Doctor orders them inside while he and Donna return to the Atmos factory. Speaking to the Centaurans, the Doctor learns that their war with the Vrutons is not going well, and they need Earth for a new breeding planet. The Doctor enters the factory, finding the real Martha and freeing her, and they then teleport to Radigan's school, finding him upset over what has happened. The Doctor develops his own atmospheric converter and takes it to the Centauran ship to try and reason with them, threatening to destroy them along with himself unless they surrender. But the Centaurans call his bluff, encouraging him to destroy them all. At that moment, Radigan teleports to the ship, switching places with the Doctor, and sacrifices himself to destroy the Centaurans. Afterwards, Martha says goodbye to the Doctor and Donna, but the TARDIS dematerializes with her still on board. The three of them land on the planet Messaline, and the group are immediately met with soldiers, who force the Doctor to put his hand into a progenitor machine, which uses his DNA to create a female soldier, making her the Doctor's daughter. They are soon confronted by the other occupants of the planet, an alien race called the Hoth, who attack them and take Martha hostage. The Doctor and Donna go to meet the human general, Cobb, and on the way, Donna names the Doctor's daughter Jenny, after Generated Anomaly. 
General Cobb tells them the two sides have been fighting for generations over something called the Source, which they believe is the breath of their creator. But when the Doctor and Donna refuse to help fight, they are imprisoned. Meanwhile, Martha helps the Hoth to discover the Source for themselves. Jenny frees the Doctor and Donna, and they make their way to the Source, discovering it to be a terraforming device within a colonizing spaceship. They realize that the Generations Long War has actually only lasted seven days in reality. Both armies arrive, and the Doctor declares the war over, but Cobb won't listen, and he fires on the Doctor, before Jenny steps in front of him and saves him, dying in the process. An enraged Doctor holds the gun to Cobb's head, before angrily throwing it aside. The Doctor and Donna take Martha home, and she says her goodbyes, but meanwhile, on Messaline, Jenny suddenly revives, commandeers a rocket, and leaves the planet for who knows what. The Doctor and Donna arrive outside a manor house in England in 1926 and invite themselves to a dinner party. They are especially thrilled when they find out that one of the guests is the famous author Agatha Christie, and the Doctor realizes that this is the day she will disappear for 10 days. After members of the party begin to turn up dead, much like one of Miss Christie's books, the Doctor enlists her help to solve the mystery, discovering that the murderer is an alien in human form known as a Vespiform, an extraterrestrial wasp species. After discovering the true identity of the murderer, the Vespiform attacks the guests, and Agatha lures it away from the house and defeats it, causing her to fall unconscious, and giving her the amnesia that will lead to her brief disappearance. They drop Agatha off somewhere safe, and the two depart. They arrive at a massive planet-sized library in the 51st century, responding to a summons from the psychic paper, but are surprised to find it completely empty, and the doctor uses a computer to find that he and Donna are the only people among trillions of non-human life signs. An information node warns them to count their shadows, and soon the overhead lights begin to turn off one by one, prompting them to run to an office where they find a floating security camera, which unknown to them is linked to a little girl. A team of explorers barge in, led by the beautiful archaeologist River Song, but financed by Strachman Lux, whose grandfather originally built the library. The team has come to determine why the library sealed itself off 100 years ago. River claims to know the Doctor, and has the diary shaped like the TARDIS, revealing it was her that summoned him here, but once she learns that the Doctor has not yet met her in his time stream, she refuses to give him any information. Suddenly, one of the team is killed, her flesh stripped from her bones, though her thought patterns preserved in her communication device continue for a few moments after her death. The Doctor explains that they are surrounded by the Vashta Narada, creatures that appear in shadows to hunt, like piranhas of the air. Soon, another member of the team, Dave, has two shadows, and both the Doctor and River use their sonic screwdrivers to make his suit denser, with the Doctor noticing River's sonic is more advanced. The Vashta Narada kill Dave and use his suit to chase after the others. The Doctor tries to teleport Donna to the TARDIS, but something goes wrong and she does not materialize properly, and her face soon appears on an information node, implying that she has died. But the Doctor soon realizes that the computer saved the consciousnesses of all the people in the library when the Vashta Narada attacked, and it has now done the same to Donna. The Doctor, River, and the remaining group members descend to the core, and the Doctor learns from the Vashta Narada that their forests were used to print the books in the library. He tells them that they can have the library once he's freed the people trapped in the core, and they allow him to do so. But as the doctor begins to strap himself into the computer in an act that will most likely kill him, River knocks him out, handcuffing him to a pillar, and takes his place. He wakes up and tries to stop her, but she knows that he must live so he can meet her in the future. Still refusing to tell him who she is, River initiates the connection, saving the trapped people, but dying in the process. As the Doctor and Donna prepare to leave, the Doctor finds River's memory print in her sonic screwdriver, and races to connect it to the computer and upload her memory pattern into the database before it dissipates. River wakes up inside the data core, surrounded by the fallen members of her team. While Donna relaxes on a spa on the planet called Midnight, the surface of which is bathed in lethal radiation, the Doctor decides to take a shuttle tour to a waterfall made of sapphires. However, mid-route, the shuttle unexpectedly stops, and after the cockpit is ripped off, one of the passengers begins acting strangely and repeating everything everyone says, ultimately settling on the doctor, and getting faster and faster until they are both speaking at exactly the same time. Soon, it is the doctor who is repeating what the woman is saying, and the passengers become convinced that whatever it was that got on the ship is now in the doctor. 
As the increasingly panicked and irrational passengers begin to throw the doctor out into space, the hostess realizes what's truly happening, and she grabs the possessed woman and throws both of them out of the airlock, saving the doctor, who is more scared than he has likely ever been in the history of this program. The doctor asks the passengers if anyone knew the hostess's name, but no one does. Returning to Donna, the doctor tells her what happened, and they depart. The doctor and Donna are in an alien marketplace when Donna is approached by a fortune teller who offers a free reading, and she helps Donna remember the key moment in her life that led to her meeting the doctor. At an intersection with her mother, Donna wanted to turn the car left to get a well-paid temp position, which is the option she originally chose, while her mother wanted her to turn right and take a job at a friend's business. The fortune teller allows Donna to choose again, and this time she chooses right, and a large beetle attaches itself to Donna's back. Her decision creates an alternate reality where she never met the doctor, and as a result, the doctor dies while fighting the Empress of the Rachnos, and cannot protect Earth from the Jadoon, the Adipos, Centaurans, or any of the others he has faced since first meeting Donna. Donna and her family live in terrible conditions, and much of the world is in ruins. Rose Tyler appears and tells Donna to come with her, but she refuses, only agreeing when her grandfather Wilfred notices the stars are beginning to disappear. Rose takes her to Unit and explains that the fabric of reality is collapsing, allowing her to travel between universes. They take Donna to the dying TARDIS, which Unit has used to build a machine, and they use it to show Donna the beetle on her back. Rose sends Donna back in time to make sure that she turns left instead of right, but as Donna races to the intersection, she realizes that she will not make it in time, and throws herself in front of a truck, causing a traffic jam that causes the present time Donna to turn left, setting the timeline correct. As the alternate Donna dies, Rose appears again, and whispers something into her ear. Back in the fortune teller's shop, the beetle falls off Donna's back, and the fortune teller runs away in fear. The doctor appears, and Donna shows him the beetle, and tries to remember what has just happened to her like a fading dream. She mentions a blonde girl, but can't remember a name, and upon repeated questioning from the doctor, Donna remembers the two words that were whispered in her ear, Bad Wolf. As the doctor runs back to the TARDIS, Bad Wolf appears everywhere, and the doctor tells Donna it's the end of the universe. Shortly after the TARDIS arrives back on Earth, the Earth literally disappears out from under them, and the doctor visits the Shadow Proclamation to try and discover its whereabouts. They find that 27 different worlds have gone missing, and Donna mentioning that the bees have also gone missing allows the Doctor to trace the planets to the Medusa Cascade, but still he cannot find them. Meanwhile, on Earth, the world is shocked to see many planets in the sky, and soon, the Daleks announce that they are behind this scheme, striking fear into the hearts of both Captain Jack Harkness and Sarah Jane Smith, both of whom have had traumatic experiences with them in the past. Former Prime Minister Harriet Jones uses a secret network to get in contact with Jack, Sarah Jane, and Martha Jones, and they agree to use all their resources to send a massive signal to the Doctor, which he uses to finally track them down. It turns out that Dalek Khan managed to travel into the Time War and save Davros, the creator of the Daleks, although it cost Dalek Khan his sanity, and he is now a raving lunatic, although it did also give him precognitive abilities. The Doctor lands the TARDIS on Earth, and upon exiting, sees Rose in the distance, but as the two run to embrace, a Dalek appears and shoots the Doctor. Jack Harkness shows up and destroys the Dalek, but it's too late, and the Doctor begins to regenerate inside his TARDIS. Luckily, the Doctor still has the severed hand he lost during the Christmas Invasion, and he channels the excess regeneration energy into that hand, preserving his current incarnation. The Doctor is captured by the Daleks and brought on their ship, and the Doctor, Rose, and Jack exit while Donna stays inside. But when the Dalek Supreme orders the TARDIS to be destroyed, Donna falls by the Doctor's hand, and the regeneration energy causes a reaction between the two of them that results in a clone of the Doctor sprouting from the hand, who then saves the TARDIS from destruction. As Davros explains his plan of using the 27 planets to create a bomb capable of destroying reality, the TARDIS appears in front of him, and the Doctor's clone and Donna try to turn the reality bomb onto the Daleks. However, when Davros electrifies them, stopping their plan, he wakes the Time Lord knowledge that Donna gained when she created the clone of the Doctor, and she quickly uses it to disable the reality bomb. The Doctors help her return the planets back to their rightful places, but are stopped before the Earth can be returned. At the last minute, the cloned Doctor destroys the Daleks and their ship, angering the real Doctor who tries to save Davros. 
but Davros refuses, calling him the Destroyer of Worlds, and appears to die. They all escape from the TARDIS and use it to tow the Earth back to its proper place in space. The Doctor returns everyone back home, including Rose and Jackie, to the parallel universe, but he leaves the clone Doctor with Rose in his absence, as he is half-human from his interaction with Donna and only has one heart, meaning he will not regenerate and can grow old with her. The two kiss, and the Doctor leaves with Donna. But Donna's mind begins to become overwhelmed with the Time Lord knowledge it now holds, and she starts to burn out. To save her, the Doctor is forced to wipe her mind, despite her attempts to stop him. He tells her family that she must never be allowed to remember him or she will die. And the Doctor leaves, after Wilfred promises that he will never forget what the Doctor did for Donna. The Doctor later lands in London on Christmas Eve, 1851, and meets a man who calls himself the Doctor. The Doctor becomes convinced that this man is a future incarnation of himself, suffering from amnesia. The two investigate some recently missing people and discover the Cybermen are behind it. They regroup at the new Doctor's TARDIS, which turns out to be a hot air balloon, or tethered aerial release developed in style. The Doctor realizes that this person is human, Jackson Lake, the first missing person, who tried to fight off the Cybermen with Cybertech about the Doctor and absorb the information after the trauma of losing his wife to the Cybermen. The Doctor enters the Cybermen complex and attempts to overload their systems, but when he is caught, Jackson Lake arrives and helps them escape. As a massive metal Cybermen called the Cyber King destroys the city, they rescue children, including Jackson's son, and then use his hot air balloon to reach the Cyber King control room. The Doctor severs the emotional controls of the Cyber King and destroys the Cybermen, using the remnants of the Daleks' dimensional vault to draw them all into the Time Vortex. Afterwards, the Doctor and Jackson share a Christmas dinner. Later, while the Doctor is riding a bus, he passes through a wormhole and ends up in the sands of a planet San Helios. However, since the bus protected them from the wormhole on the way in, they cannot travel back out without something around them. Using a crystal they find on the planet, they are able to levitate the bus back through the wormhole just in time, and the Doctor helps one of the passengers escape capture by police for stealing from a museum. However, another passenger with low-level psychic abilities tells the Doctor that his song is ending soon, and that he will knock four times. The Doctor next arrives on Mars in the year 2059, near humanity's first Martian colony, Bowie Base 1. He is brought into the base and interrogated, and the Doctor realizes that today is a fixed point in time, when the base will explode, killing the entire crew. But their deaths will inspire the Captain's granddaughter to explore the stars. He tries to stay uninvolved, but the Captain forces him to assist her. When people become infected with an intelligent virus that causes them to leak water, they name it the Flood and determine that they can't allow it to spread to Earth. The captain orders the crew to evacuate, but the pilot becomes infected, and he destroys the rocket to prevent the flood from escaping. Despite knowing it's wrong, the doctor saves the captain and the remaining crew moments before the base explodes, returning them to Earth. The captain demands to know why he changed history, but the doctor insists that he can break the laws because he alone has that power, calling himself the Time Lord Victorious. The captain tells him she doesn't care who he is, before stepping into her home and promptly committing suicide. The Doctor, shocked, questions if maybe it is time for him to die, before defiantly piloting the TARDIS away. Back on the Ood Sphere, the Ood tell the Doctor that the Master has returned, and back on Earth, a ritual is performed to revive him, but his ex-wife sabotages the ceremony, causing the Master to return with great strength, but also an unstoppable hunger. The Doctor lands on Earth and runs into Wilfred, who helps him track the Master down, finding him in the wastelands outside of London. He learns that the Master is hearing a constant drumming in his head, but before he can go on, the Master is captured by the billionaire Joshua Naismith, who has recovered a broken immortality gate and wants the Master to fix it for him. The Master does indeed fix it, but reprograms it to replace all of humankind's DNA with his own, making them literally a Master race. With only Wilfred and Donna unaffected, the rest of humankind is changed into a copy of the Master, as the Doctor looks on in horror. At the same time, the President of the Time Lords declares that the Time Lords have returned, as he has implanted the drums into the Master's head and is using that signal to pull Gallifrey out of the Time Lock. Fearing what the Time Lords will bring into this world, the Doctor takes a gun from Wilfred and confronts both the Master and the President, not knowing which to shoot. The Doctor uses the gun to sever the Time Lord's connection to the signal in the Master's head, and Gallifrey is pulled back into the Time Lock. 
The president tries to kill the doctor, but the master stops him, saving the doctor in revenge for what the president did to him. The doctor considers himself successful, but realizing that Wilfred is trapped in a control room that will soon be flooded with radiation, he proudly, but also regretfully, sacrifices his life for Wilfred's by stepping into the adjoining control room and absorbing the radiation. After dropping Wilfred off back home, the doctor visits his past companions before traveling forward in time to Donna's wedding and giving Wilfred a winning lottery ticket to give her, bought with money lent to him by her deceased father. Lastly, the doctor visits Rose on New Year's Day, 2005, three months before she will meet him as the ninth doctor, and he tells her that she will have a really great year. Back in the TARDIS, the doctor finally succumbs to the radiation poisoning like the third and sixth doctors before him, and with his last words of, I don't want to go, the beloved tenth doctor regenerates, with the energy from his body destroying the TARDIS around him. So, that was my speed run summary of the tenth doctor's tenure in the TARDIS, and boy was it a long one. I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel for new videos every week. And be sure to check out my other videos, including Doctors 1 through 9 already, and 11 and 12 coming soon. Let me know what you'd like me to cover next in the comments below, and as always, thank you for being my companion on this journey today. I'm the Doctor, bye for now.